I am willing to bet that most people have thought at some point, what would I do if I wielded absolute power? How would I solve all the problems that plague my society? If only I had the power to do so. But how do you rule? Why do dictators often act in selfish, self-destructive, short-sighted and violent ways? The truth is, no man truly rules alone, and they usually have an unseen inner circle of lackeys to help them. However, there are many instances in history which prove that if you go too far, it can have catastrophic consequences. For example, the Sun King Louis XIV is still the longest reigning monarch in French and European history. He reigned for over 72 years as he was crowned when he was 4 years old. France was the wealthiest and most powerful kingdom in mainland Europe under his rule. He saw himself, like many monarchs of that time, as a representative of God, and since everything revolves around the sun and it gives life, everything revolved around him and therefore he gave life. Fast forward two generations, and the last king of the Ancien Régime before the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte, Louis XVI, was guillotined. This was the beginning of the slow unravelling of royal rule in Europe, paving the road to democracy, an authoritarian ruler's worst nightmare. So, how do you avoid these pitfalls? This is all an inconvenience to an aspiring dictator. As democracy started cropping up across the world, strong men realised they couldn't just seize power by force alone anymore. Coups and assassinations are still possible, however what these democratic dictators of today realised is that naked power and ambition has an expiration date and is dangerous, as it puts a target on one's back. If you seize power through force alone, what is to stop the people rising up if you go too far, or your rivals doing the same unto you? As a dictator, you do not want to get your hands dirty. You want to convince others to act on your behalf, using the state as a vehicle to fuel your actions. You will require vast funds, a large army, and a group of loyal minions to run it. The team you surround yourself with is what ensures your success or failure. Two prominent examples of benevolent dictators are Gaius Julius Caesar, or his successor Octavian, better known as Augustus, the first Caesar of Rome. They understood that if they took power with force, they would be no better than their elitist opponents in the Senate, as they felt the Republic had become corrupt and compromised. Therefore, they took a different approach with populist-inspired policies. They simply did the opposite of their opponents to gain power. They accepted it was an exchange of value. They had to appeal to people's self-interest for people to care about theirs. It's a game of give and take, or as we would call it, bribery. They gave people jobs, homes, food, land and money. You have to identify what people need and desire most and provide it, but make them realise that if they don't give you their undying loyalty, it can be snatched away. They understood that power lay with the people and the military, and if they loved you, you could do anything. So, as a result, these populist policies paved the way for them to cross the Rubicon to godlike power. Essentially, this is the complete opposite of someone like the Sun King, and in my opinion, the superior method. Obviously, Julius Caesar wasn't ruthless enough with his opponents, as he was assassinated in 44 BCE by the senators who opposed his populist policies. This is where Octavian learned from his mistakes, and made sure nobody could oppose him, predominantly by exiling, threatening and assassinating people when he couldn't buy their loyalty. However, he was careful not to appear ruthless publicly, or indeed appear as an emperor at all. Even though he was eagerly offered the position by the Senate, he feigned to begrudgingly accept powers which effectively ended the Republic being bestowed upon him, preferring to be referred to as first citizen, as he wanted to be seen as a man of the people. People were willing to give up their ideals, because ideals don't feed and clothe people, but Octavian did, so why not let him be emperor? He was doing more for them than those so-called senators. All he did was provide what the Republic was lacking, which let's be honest was a lot, and everyone flocked to him. He still retained the Republican sensibilities of Rome, which was all an illusion. 
In reality, he was the one who was pulling the strings as an omnipresent force in everyone's lives, and went on to create the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, which lasted for 200 years, and he has gone down in history as Rome's greatest Caesar who shaped the Western world. In his own words, I found Rome a city of bricks and left it a city of marble. You need to ensure that the government you just inherited is on your side. It's usually best to just outright overthrow the old regime, but sometimes it's also prudent to retain certain individuals who could be useful. This means creating a new coalition. You need to bring new members into the fold who oppose many of the old regime's supporters. Promoting too many radical allies can be dangerous. You need some balance. So it is smart to bring in some allies who are not loyal to the old regime, or even the revolution that overthrew them, but are loyal to you and you alone. You want them to be competent, but pliable, and not too ambitious, so as not to overthrow you. You need good loyal dogs. Sway them to your side and the power is yours, but if you don't appease them, they will replace you. You need to get the key supporters on your side. With them, you have the power to do anything. Without them, you have nothing. The coalition you set up should never be set in stone. As long as there's a revolution, there's a counter-revolution. So you need to consistently depose members and ensure loyalty from others. You can ensure your lackeys never rise to your level of power via circumstances you take advantage of. For instance, Saddam Hussein was in power for 30 years because his number two Prime Minister Tariq Aziz was a Christian who could never lead an Islamic State. Essentially in every crisis there is opportunity. You can't become a dictator under normal political, social and economic circumstances. Why would anyone want that? It's not in their benefit, and people are resistant to change. Every dictator in history came to power through a vacuum during a crisis or great social change. As they say, never let a good crisis go to waste. Either they take advantage of the chaotic circumstances of their time, or they manufacture them if possible. Kim Il-sung took over the war tour in north of Korea after World War II. Benito Mussolini's main selling point was that Italy needed a dictator to save them from a communist uprising. Adolf Hitler came to power after Germany's defeat in World War I and economic woes as a result. Joseph Stalin came to power in a vacuum after the Russian Revolution and Vladimir Lenin dying. In times of crisis when everyone is suffering, people fall back into their tribal instincts. They instinctively follow whoever promises change and who provides the answers to guide their nation to a better future. They want a utopia. The worse the crisis, the better, and the more godlike you appear to the gullible masses. If something feels new to the people, and more importantly, it sounds fair, power is yours. Don't get hung up on this too much, as your political ideology is just for appearances. It's simply the vehicle you will use to seize power. Once you're in power, all that nonsense can go out the window. The world is a stage, and you have to treat yourself as an actor on that stage. Hitler saw himself as Europe's greatest actor, Mussolini saw himself as Italy's finest actor. For instance, he carefully studied certain gestures and poses to see which commanded the most authority. He tensed up his facial muscles, jaw and voice in public while letting them relax in private. Every word, every gesture, every tonal change in your voice, every aspect of your body language contributes to putting the populace under your authoritarian spell. Make sure you are utilizing all aspects of media to get your face into the public eye, so you can build enough support to take power when the time is right. There is no specific way in which to achieve this. In the case of North Korea, Kim Il-sung was backed and put in power by the Soviets without actually having much public support. For Mussolini, he convinced everyone that only he could save Italy and was granted the prime minister position. Hitler came to power after his failed coup, after he was backed by wealthy elites due to their fears of a communist uprising, and became chancellor before securing ultimate power. Over time, you need to reduce your coalition, so that the people you require to be in power are reduced. 
therefore consolidating it in your hands. You have to reduce it over time. You cannot make them feel threatened simultaneously, as they will close ranks against you. Despite the concept of having elections in a dictatorship sounding ludicrous, it's not for the people, as they are obviously rigged. They are held to remind your coalition that they are replaceable. For example, in 1917, Lenin introduced universal suffrage in the USSR to ensure a government representative that reflected the people's interests wasn't elected. Another thing that is crucial is controlling the money flow. This will ensure you retain your position by bribing lackeys and buying loyalty. You must figure out how to best raise capital and distribute resources so as not to topple the house of cards upon which your base of power sits. As an aspiring benevolent dictator, you may want to help your citizens like Caesar, but there's only so much cash in the coffers, only so much resources your nation produces, so it's a balancing act. It's a lot easier when you have an empire at your disposal, but this isn't always possible. If you spend too much on the people or infrastructure, it can give your rivals ammo. Money poured into roads, universities and hospitals is money a rival can promise to key supporters if only they switch sides. The only thing you can bank on is that people are motivated by self-interest, so you have to make sure they have a reason to support you, otherwise it's all over. Ideally though, you need to walk a line between keeping your coalition as happy as possible and your citizens healthy enough to maximise tax revenues based on how you run a dictatorship. On one side, we have citizens who are so fat and rich that they never think about deposing a leader. On the other side, we have citizens so starving and uneducated that overthrowing a government is literally an impossible task. This creates a breeding ground for evolution. We want to avoid that. You need to pick which society you want to run. For cash flow, the latter one would be the optimum. If you choose the former, as long as you pay your inner circle, you'll probably have to reinvest some of that tax money back into the population, but not too much. You don't want people to think you are a philanthropist. Taxes are a great source of revenue, but when the people have no say in their government, it's easy to get carried away and tax the hell out of them. If you do that, you need to remember that taxes are directly timed with productivity, so you need to find a comfortable balance where you can maximize the money you squeeze out of your subjects. You could create a governmental organization like the IRS, but this is a mass threat to your power because you have one institution controlling all the money flow in the country, and you can see how that can threaten your leadership. Indirect taxes are a fantastic way to solve this problem because they put the burden of taxation right onto the people, saving you time and money and making them pay more. Unfortunately, taxing requires people to actually work, which means you have to provide them with some basic infrastructure. However, geography could bless you with rare earth materials, precious metals or stones. You can just round up your subjects and throw them into the pits. There, you can keep them starving, isolated and ignorant. If you have oil and gas, it's your lucky day. What you can do is lease it off to a foreign company, none of your subjects will need to work on it, and you will still get a big fat paycheck for doing absolutely nothing. Your state needs to be a one-party state for two main reasons. In Russia, Lenin and then Stalin made any action that they took such as sending people to the gulags in Siberia, not their decision, but the will of the people. They voted for him, so obviously they wanted it, right? It opened all citizens to party affiliation, which means every single citizen has a slight chance of rising through the ranks of the Communist Party, which makes them complicit. This was how the petty criminal Stalin, the broke artist Hitler, and the uneducated Nikita Khrushchev came to power. It's thanks to this power that inner party members are kept in line because they know they'll be exiled or killed if they don't do exactly as you ask. Essentially, your country needs to be like a cult with you as the religious deity. Even if your inner party members go against you, the people who are your rabid cult followers could be manipulated to take them down, and vice versa. There is a reason why the Soviet Union or any communist regime were atheists. The leader is the god, the party is the religion, that fills the void of the hearts and minds of the public that religion left behind when it was banned. Instead of a god, it's a weapon. 
a weapon aimed at the hearts and minds of the weak and the desperate. It will give you control of the education curriculum, which will be dedicated to learn about the greatness of the leader. You need to get them young after all. The masses may stay by your side no matter what, but elite supporters will always watch the balance of power, ready to change allegiance at a moment's notice in a shifting web of alliances. In countries where the keys to power are few, the rewards are great, and when violence rules, might wins. You must buy all the loyalty you can, because loyalty in dictatorships is everything. Dictators usually have mismanaged economies. This is by design, because autocracies don't want to keep their financial records public. If they do, any challenger can promise to pay your enemies more to inspire them to rise up against you, so you must make your coalition rich and everybody else poor to retain your power. This is the self-sustaining core of power. Everything else is secondary to this mantra. The main issue you'll find is you'll be managing many people and their desires and needs, including their rivalries with each other, not just their expenses. The more powerful supporters a ruler has on average, the shorter their reign. Therefore, you need to minimize key supporters. If someone has outlived their usefulness, you must remove them. After a successful coup, you will purge some of those who helped you come to power while working with the lackeys of the previous dictator, which, from the outside, seems contradictory. However, the key to gaining power is not the same as what it takes to retain it. Having someone on the payroll who was vital in the past, but useless now, is the same as spending money on the citizens. A dictator that pulls off a coup has usually promised greater rewards to those switching sides. The amount of funds has not altered, so the money must be split among fewer supporters. A successful dictator that retains the right lackeys, takes control of the finances, cuts unnecessary spending and eliminates unnecessary followers, will have a long and successful reign. Now you're in power, it's time to get that propaganda machine running. As you gain more power, you want to use mass media to make yourself omnipresent in people's lives. You should aim to plaster your face everywhere, have images of yourself in people's homes, have your writings and speeches aired constantly on repeat on news stations, social media and radio. Set up loudspeakers in public squares and give grand speeches. Have mainstream media promote and spread positive stories about yourself whilst silencing your critics. Rename streets, cities and build statues of yourself in your honour. You could even take it to extremes and go a bit crazy, making people believe you have superpowers. Whatever works. The point is, Big Brother is watching you. If your subjects say or do the wrong thing, it's not just them that are in big trouble, it could be their entire family. You must be prepared to extinguish entire bloodlines. You must make it a requirement to publicly praise you and worship you, or else they'll face severe consequences. Why do you think North Korea forces everyone to bow to their statues every time they pass by and make them cry when they visit Kim Jong-il's tomb as a pilgrimage? Why do you think Xi Jinping forces subjects to repeat phrases like I love the CCP or has a law regarding social harmony in China? They aren't idiots. They know people aren't just going to magically and blindly love them just because they bow to statues and visit tombs and pretend to cry. The goal is to create that illusion of public support as you get more tyrannical. If the public sees everyone around them as worshipping and praising you, and they are well aware that people who question you get snitched on and are thrown into labour camps or unalived, who can they trust? Who can they confide in? This plays into your hands and forces people to praise you in public, which increases your power. It makes it harder for people to band together to try to take you down. If everyone is lying, how do they know who's really lying and who feels the same about you as they do? How do they know if stating their true feelings to their neighbour will mean they end up in a dingy cell being interrogated by the secret police? It may all be an illusion, but power itself is an illusion. That's the genius of it. Divide and conquer. Run a massive long-term psyop to keep the people divided, paranoid and confused through obfuscation and subterfuge. As your power becomes more undeniable, you're going to create groups of people who don't support you. Therefore, it's important to have effective punishments ready to keep them in line. The go-to punishment every dictatorship has used in the past are labour camps, but there are more savage punishments such as torture and execution. Or you could always strip them of their position and assets, 
or exile them in less severe cases where they don't pose as much of a threat. Naturally, as your subjects become more submissive, you can create more extreme or sadistic punishments. This combination of pure fear, awe, and deity-like worship makes for a powerful cocktail. As I said prior, when Kim Il-sung died, the populace wasn't just crying hysterically because they genuinely loved their benevolent leader. I'm sure there were some hardcore true believers doing that, but the main reason was, if they didn't join in on the mass hysteria and seemed like they were distraught, the secret police would cart them off to a labour camp. This made the mob try to outdo one another in mourning so they wouldn't get punished. This type of terror makes people display more public admiration for their great leader, which increases that cult of personality effect, which increases the fear, which in turn increases the cult and so solidifying your rule in a vicious yet ingenious cycle. After this, all you have to do to increase your power is scale up the hysteria and insanity open more gulags and ban all foreign currency and imports like North Korea did in 1968. You could also ban foreign trade and diplomacy, because the more uneducated the populace, the easier they are to control. You want to be the king of the peasants in the hermit kingdom. Or a slightly different approach would be to imitate Stalin and force all broadcasters to end every sentence they say with, thank you comrade Stalin, for I am joyous comrade Stalin. Organize your subjects into classes based on their loyalty to you and use that to determine how much resources are given to them, such as food rations, access to education, employment opportunities, etc. Making sure where people can live, who they can marry, what they can do in life is determined by their status in the country. A great example of this is China's social credit score system. Under China's social credit score system, being discredited makes it hard to get a job, a loan, a hotel room, access to medicine, or putting your children in good schools or universities, or even buying a car. As you give speeches around the country, order locals to attend, or they'll get fined or prison time. Ban things that make people feel like individuals, such as popular pieces of media, religion, or folk tales. Get creative with it. You can dictate to the public what to wear, what kind of haircuts they can have, what kind of makeup they can wear, if any at all, what kind of songs they can sing, what kind of films they can watch, or even what kind of dances they can dance. Or you can ban anything that cannot be nationalized and centralized like the Khmer Rouge did. You must rewrite history to glorify you, making other people's deeds in history your own. Pol Pot had a concept called Year Zero, where Cambodia's history began from his rule and everything else that came before was wiped out or banned. Mao Zedong oversaw the Cultural Revolution, eradicating China's past in order to move forward into the future under Mao. Use doublethink like in the novel 1984, all whilst utilizing a dedicated group of secret police, spies, informants, interrogators and torturers. The next generation that grows up under your control will have no idea how things were before. This is what they know. This is their reality. Especially after the first generation dies off, you'll be left with a populace that thinks that this is just how things are and always will be. They will think the outside world is a hellscape, and they will want to stay close to the bosom of their glorious leader. As long as you don't get assassinated by your own family or your top brass, that is. Remember to like and subscribe and hit the bell notifications. Check out the links below to support the channel and I'll see you next time.